All right, welcome to podcast 4.2. And what we're going to do is we're going to continue on our journey with the periodic table. If you recall in our last podcast, we talked about uh, how the periodic table was developed with Mendeleev and Mosley, uh, the groups, valence, electrons, uh, the periodic law, and all that stuff. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the columns of the periodic table and get to know the families and some of their properties. But before we do that, I want to talk about this main group elements because you're going to hear that term quite a bit when we're talking about the main group elements these are those elements within the s and p block and if i do a, a quick switch to the periodic table here that we're talking about this group right here as you know being the s block right and this group right here in the p block so we're talking about all these elements right here and uh Oops, not very good at drawing line, straight lines with this pen for some reason. Uh, but anyways, there's you know there's a proof positive why I'm not an art teacher. Uh, but those are the two groups, and uh, as far as the main group elements, that's where so much chemistry happens. At least in this first year, we talk a lot a bit about uh, the S and P groups and, and all the reactions they do, and it's really where a lot of interesting stuff happens. So you're going to hear that quite a bit. So let's look at this first group. Now, if you notice on this, this group right here, uh, group number one, it looks like it's missing something. Okay, And if you were to look on your periodic table, you would see that there is, of course, an H at the top of this column because that's where hydrogen resides. But hydrogen, I'm not putting it up there right now because really it's not an alkali metal. Hydrogen has no family because of its unique properties. So we really don't worry about that. When we're talking about... The alkali metals, we're talking about these ones right here. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. All right? So let's look at this group and some of the properties because it is a fabulous group as far as reactivity goes. Uh, this group is, is the most reactive metals, and the reason it is is right there, right here, due to the single valence electrons. So just a little blast from the past of electron configuration. If you were to look at the, uh, the electron configuration of all of those, they all end in S1, right? For example, lithium would be uh, 2S1, and sodium would be 3S1, and 4S1, and so on, okay? This one valence electron uh, causes it to be very reactive uh, for reasons of, it just, it'll, it wants to get rid of it, okay? Because if it does, it'll form an octet, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later. So, the other cool thing about these is they react vigorously with water. And I'll show you a real neat video. And uh, one of the cool things about that is as you go down the, the row, it gets more reactive. It's more reactive. So sodium is uh, more is is reactive to a certain degree. Potassium even more so. Rubidium and cesium, uh, they get more reactive. And uh, I'll show you a couple clips um, showing that because it's kind of neat to watch. Uh, another property for the alkali metals, and uh, I believe this is where the name alkaline metals comes from, is that they form alkaline solutions. When combined with water. Now, an alkaline solution is a basic solution. Everyone gets freaked out about, ooh, acids are bad. Well, bases do just as much damage. And so what happens is if I take some sodium metal and I add it to some water, it makes this stuff called sodium hydroxide. And it also makes some hydrogen gas. Okay, oh, I should balance it. We have a dead balance in here, but let's at least balance it anyways. All right. And this stuff right here, sodium hydroxide, if you've ever seen the movie Fight Club, is what got put on uh, that guy's arm that caused the burn. I mean, bases are very, very damaging. They're just as damaging as acids. Uh, but people don't really go, ooh, base, you know. They only worry about acids. So let's get this out of the way. Okay. So let's look at another thing, another property about this very cool reactive group. Okay. They're really shiny, but they dull quickly as they react with oxygen and air. So you've got this metal, and again, this is another little video clip I'll show you. Let's say I've got a bar of sodium, and I come in with a knife, and I cut it. Okay, Right where I cut it, it's really shiny, but then it gets gray. 
it turns gray real fast. And the reason it does that is because this stuff is so reactive. We've got water vapor in the air. Of course, we have oxygen in the air. And it forms some oxides and uh, probably even some hydroxides there. So um, this stuff dulls really quickly. But it is super shiny at first. But not shiny uh, like if you see a shiny piece of silver where it just stays shiny all the time. The alkali metals will not do that. Okay, another cool property about this family is you won't find them in nature in their pure form. There's, and, and as a little side, we store them in oil. In other words, you're not going to find any potassium. Now people go, well, wait a minute, there's potassium in bananas. But we're not talking about potassium, the compound, because potassium in ba bananas is combined with other elements. But you won't find any of these uh, in nature. And the... Probably the reason why is if you look at this, look at this. They react vigorously in water. Well, what do we have a lot of in this planet? We have a lot of water, right? So if you had a piece of sodium laying in the ground and water got to it, uh, it would quickly uh, form sodium hydroxide and some hydrogen gas or some oxides, and uh, that, of course, wouldn't happen. So you these have to be uh, manufactured, basically, or uh, reacted to get them from compounds. And... Uh, because of this second part right here, because they react with oxygen and water, they are stored in oil. So by storing them in oil, they don't have a chance to react with uh, the water or the oxygen in there. And the last cool thing about these is they're soft and they can be cut with a knife. The, the sodium that I have has about a Play-Doh consistency. So if you've played with Play-Doh, you know how it's kind of mushy. And for a metal, it's kind of weird to cut to be able to cut through it. But all these metals in this whole group are very soft. So that's our first group, the alkali metals. Now if we move over one more to, row, uh, to column two, these are the alkaline earth metals. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. Okay? And they have properties that are similar to group one metals, but less so. All right, so they're less reactive than alkali metals. They're harder, and they have a higher melting point. I'll show you some calcium. I'll put it in water, and it'll fizz. All right, so it'll be it'll react, but it'll react in a in a degree that's less. Okay, calcium metal is harder. I can't sit and cut it with a knife like you can uh, sodium. It's harder, and if you wanted to melt it, you've got to heat these guys up to a, a lot higher temperature than you do the alkali metals. Uh, another thing about the alkaline earth metals is because they are fairly reactive, you're not going to find them in their pure form in nature either. You'll find them in compounds, um, and that's just kind of due to the fact that uh, they are very reactive. So you'll find them in compounds. You won't find them in the pre, uh, free form of nature. The, the important thing to know about the alkali earth metals is they're less reactive and harder, and they have a higher melting point than the alkaline earth metals. On to our next group, the halogens, my favorite group. Okay, the halogens, is you got to go way over to now. Now, this is a, a picture that I pulled from somewhere, but they don't have the groups numbered the way that your periodic table does, but this is really group 17, all right? The 7B and the A's and the Roman numerals we used to use, that's not really used anymore. But it goes through fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine. And um, here's an example of each one. Although this is not fluorine, this is fluorite, so the, the element fluorine is in a crystal. This is chlorine gas, notice that yellow gas. This is bromine, uh, it's a... It's a brown liquid, um, and then here's iodine. It's hard to really see here, but iodine is like a purple-black. It's really a cool picture, really a neat picture. So so let's look at a couple uh, properties of, of the halogens. They are the most non-reactive, or most reactive non-metals because of their electron configuration. Think about what all these elements have. They all end in what? P5, right? P5, P5, P5. And what do we know that is a real stable electron configuration? P6, like uh, all the uh, noble gases. So these elements all 
are gladly accepting one electron. So that makes them very reactive because chemistry reaction or chemical reactions is when electrons are being moved or shared. Okay, so they're very reactive. Oops. They react with most metals to produce salts. And when we say salts here, don't think of table salt, although table salt is definitely one of them, sodium chloride. It's really any kind of ionic compound, and this is group 1 metals, right? But uh, let's say we could have copper, copper chloride, okay? So they produce salts, and, and, and another, maybe a better way to say this is ionic compounds. Although, we have not really gone over what that is yet. But hey, again, something to look forward to, right? Let's move on. A couple more properties, or at least one more. Well, this is the thing that I like about this family the most. All three states of matter are in this family. Fluorine and chlorine, at room temperature, are gases. Okay. Bromine at room temperature, is a liquid. And iodine, and I imagine acetine, I've never seen it, at room temperatures are solid. Okay, so kind of a cool little thing. All three states of matter you'll find uh, in this row, and I think that's kind of unique. All right, and then last but not least, if you're going to find these things, uh, you can find them in seawater, and you can find them in the Earth's crust. Now, you're writing all this stuff going, what in the world am I going to do? What I want you to do is kind of have a, a, a feeling for, for what are some properties what we, uh, of each of these families. I know it's only been three so far, but uh, it's important that you get this stuff in your brain. So it's good that you're writing these down in your notes. You're probably pausing the video, and uh, last but, but not least, you'll go ahead and Hopefully, study that stuff. Let's go to the last family of the day, and that is the noble gases. All right. Now, the reason they're noble gases and uh, is because they have a full octet. Right? You remember that stuff, okay? In other words, uh, neon its electron configuration is two um, p. Oops. Let's go ahead and put the s in there. 2p, whoa, I did it again. Okay, third time's a charm, maybe. 2s2, 2p6, right? And all these end in p6, which is a very stable electron configuration, right? So, noble gases, our last family. What are some uh, properties or, or uses of these? Well, as you know, as what I've just said, they have a full set, set of valence electrons in their outer energy level. Makes them very stable. Extremely stable. Um, do you recognize this down here? Okay. These are some uh, emission tubes that we looked at during our lab. And it is in the order of, uh, I think, boy, I don't know if I can, let's see, can we get an, ex yeah, I can't tell. It should be in the order. We've got helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. And so uh, going this way, um, Oops, and then, yeah, and, and so on, okay? So that's our, uh, those are just pictures, and you've seen those in real life, right? So just reminding you there. So what else about noble gases? Well, they have a very low reactivity, right? And it's because of this full octet. And it, it's my understanding that uh, up to date, uh, they've never gotten helium or neon to react with anything, ever. They've gotten some compounds for argon and krypton. Or maybe it goes all the way to argon. Boy, I know there's krypton and xenon compounds. Uh, I'm not sure about argon. But anyways, uh, they have a very low reactivity because they've got a full octet, right? And then last but not least, here's some uses for it. Used in balloons, obviously, right? Who hasn't had a helium balloon and maybe breathed in it and talked at a very high level? Neon lights, right? There you go, neon lights. And then this blank is for manufacturing. Kind of a weird thing. But imagine you're in a factory 
and you're making a compound or you're making something that you want to be super pure. Well, the problem is oxygen in the air will tend to react with a lot of things. So what you do is you take your room. All right, you got your room. Some Richardson drawing here. And you just pump it full of, of neon. Okay. And is neon going to react? Heck no, it's not going to react. It's inert, right? It's a noble gas. So neon's filling the room. Now I can make whatever I want, my super pure metal, and it's not going to react with oxygen. All right? So there's the first part of 4.2, and it's just those four groups. Write that stuff down, get it in your notebook, review it a little bit, and uh, again, like always, if you've got questions, uh, just ask me tomorrow in class. See you later. Bye.